Well, we've just wrapped up the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. And of course, these uh, freedom hating billionaires that are trying to create a one world government that they control have put out all kinds of crazy things that they would like to foist upon the American people and on the global population. To help me better understand this, I have Seamus Bruner with me. Seamus, thank you so much for coming on today. Hey, Stephen, it's great to be with you. Always a pleasure. So uh, you've got your book out, Controligark, where you talk about uh, people like Jeff Bezos. Uh, you, you talk about Bill Gates, the World Economic Forum, George Soros, uh, the Steve Jobs family, uh, on and on. I want to specifically uh, dial in on what's going on with the World Economic Forum. If you could just give, give a little bit of background on them and why you believe they are one of the most dangerous groups in the world today. Yeah, sure. So uh, Davos 2024, it was really more of the same. Um, it's, you know, an annual meeting. They get together. This would be uh, the group I call the Controligarchs, which are the billionaires and bureaucrats plotting and scheming to dominate every aspect of our lives. We can get into what the, the whole 2024 agenda is. But going back uh, to the very beginnings, it was founded by this guy, Klaus Schwab. He seems sort of like a Bond villain. He's, you know, shaved head, thick German accent. Um, and, you know, he seems like a sinister dude, kind of a caricature, uh, maybe like a Dr. Evil type. Klaus Schwab is really he uh, started his career. He's a bit of a nerd. He was a professor. He's an academic type, um, not exactly the type of person you'd expect um, to set up, you know, the, the billionaire's playground, the most exclusive country club in the world. Um, he was raised in Germany, born in Regensburg. And uh, his father, Eugen Schwab, was a uh, engineer who worked for a company, Escher Wies, which was a supplier to the Nazi war effort. And so the factory that uh, Klaus Schwab's father ran was uh, making things like flamethrowers that would be used against allied troops. And Escher Wies, the Swiss company, um, was actually working on nuclear technology for the Nazi effort. And so that is kind of the world that Klaus Schwab grew up in. Now, he was too young to actually participate in the Nazi war effort. Um, but it's interesting because he, you know, because of that experience, he was really not able to um, I have a national identity. Um, you know, when you after the war, you can't really uh, be proud of your your heritage when you're uh, the son of a Nazi wartime supplier. Um, and it's very interesting because he goes to Harvard after he studies in Germany and Switzerland. He goes to Harvard, um, and that's where he gets linked up with Henry Kissinger. Now, Henry Kissinger uh, is, you know, a, a Jewish refugee of sorts, and he came to America. And so, what what could these two men possibly have in common? And the book really explores this, where um, because they didn't have a nation that they could identify with, they really considered themselves citizens of the world. And uh, there's a lot of other people like this, George Soros for example, considers himself a citizen of the world. Now, they may have dual nationalities, but um, a lot of the control oligarchs, they don't really identify with a single nation. They use you know, various countries to get wealthy. Uh, David Rockefeller, for example, is a main character in the book. He, uh, he has a quote uh, at the top of chapter one where you know, America made the Rockefellers the richest family in world history uh, for a time. You'd think he would be grateful, but this quote from David Rockefeller says, uh, some even believe that my family and me are part of some cabal working against the interests of the United States, uh, that we are trying to create a one world, if you will, with you know no, no nations or sovereignty, just kind of like a, an EU type organization. He says, if that's the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. And so Rockefeller, Kissinger, Klaus Schwab, uh, these types, Soros, they don't love nations and, and national boundaries. They think there should be no boundaries. Soros is uh, contributing greatly to the erosion of the boundaries of the United States. And so what is this really all about um, in this bringing in the border crisis that we're seeing a lot about right now? The number one goal of the control oligarchs, people like Klaus Schwab and even Bill Gates and George Soros, their number one goal is to transfer power and control away from nations towards international organizations, supranational organizations, 
things like the United Nations, the World Health Organization, uh, the World Economic Forum, and and things that they control. And so they, you know, when you realize that that their number one goal is to sort of subvert national identities and and nations and turn this into sort of a one world situation, all of their activities begin to make sense. And so, you know, looking at Davos 2024, um, it's, it's that, I mean, everything they're doing and working for towards the future is about eroding national identities, national boundaries, and, and creating a one world type situation. Um, and just, uh, you know, you asked about the history of the World Economic Forum. Klaus Schwab, he gets mentored by Henry Kissinger at Harvard. He then goes back to uh, Germany and Switzerland, where he sets up the European Management Symposium. That was the precursor to Davos, uh, the World Economic Forum. Um, and really from the 1970s forward, he just starts collecting world leaders and, and powerful businessmen, um, you know, types of various diplomats and, and NGO uh, bureaucrat types. Um, and they all start coming to Switzerland. He just he started with six thousand dollars in seed money, and now Davos collects over three hundred million dollars a year in sponsorships and membership fees and and things like that. And so that's kind of the 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 quick in a nutshell history of the World Economic Forum. It was created by globalists. They don't love nations. They love the idea of everybody kind of contributing to a one world system. Yeah. So I watched I watched part of it, um, probably the conservative part of it, where uh, Argentina's new president, Millet, rips into them about how their policies are destroying the world, that capitalism, proper capitalism uh, with government support is the right way forward. You then have the president of the Heritage Foundation telling them uh, that they are the ones ruining the world that it is their policies, their beliefs that have actually made us a more unstable uh, world over the last few years and how they should be very scared to have a Donald Trump second term, things like that. But what were what were some of your big takeaways? What are the what are the things that they would love to push on us? I know before it was digital IDs and uh, vaccine mandates and vaccine passports. What are some of the big 2024 goals against humanity? Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, Javier Malay's speech was fantastic. He he nailed it. If you haven't seen that, you need to go watch that because that is exactly right. Uh, they are part of the problem. He said their time is up. Dr. Kevin Robert, Roberts uh, from the Heritage Foundation uh, said the same. They're, you know, These guys have way too much power and they are uh, working against the interests of the people. Um, Dr. Roberts actually gave me a shout out on Twitter. He read control oligarchs before he went over there into the belly of the beast. And he said that uh, control oligarchs was vital to his preparation. So I'm very proud of that. Um, but what, the, so you could actually tell because uh, th that Davos realizes we, the people were waking up, we're not in favor of what they're doing. Um, they tried to pay a little lip service. That's why they invited Javier Malay and, and Dr. Roberts. Um, their theme, their stated theme this year in Davos was rebuilding trust. So they know that they've destroyed our trust. Um, they think that they can rebuild it. I, you know, I'm a little skeptical. Uh, the more people realize what Davos is doing and, and these people like Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates and all of these control oligarchs are doing, the more people see what's going on. There's no way that they can rebuild our trust because they're not slowing down with their mission to, yes, digitalize everything. That was uh, that came out of the Great Reset. So when Klaus Schwab announced in July 2020 that it's time to have a Great Reset, this is really right as the pandemic's getting going. People are like, what does he mean by a, a reset? I mean, essentially what he was saying is we need to flip off and on the power switch to the global economy. We need to lock you all down, need to crush your small businesses, need to make your kids dumber by holding them out of school. Um, that was the reset part. Now we're still in the, the build back better phase. And so Klaus Schwab, during that great reset speech, said that there's a few things that we need to do when we rebuild back better. Uh, we need to build back a greener economy. And so that's all the climate change stuff is really reaching a fever pitch. I mean, it's not even climate change anymore. They're talking about climate crises. And, that, and that's a key. You know, everything's a crisis. And why? Because fear gets people to relinquish control over their lives. And so they use that word crises uh, to scare you. So 
climate crises, rebuilding greener, that's, you know, one part of the great reset. But another part that a lot of people are, you know, starting to realize is the digitalization of everything. Klaus Schwab said, we need to digitalize everything. And so that would be your identities, that would be your currency, uh, the curriculum. I mean, in schools, they're basically just giving kids laptops now um, with, you know, various social emotional learning, which is like DEI for kids. Um, and so that's, you know, that's another part of the digitalizing everything. Um, the CBDCs and the currency, it, there's a big push and it's happening sort of behind the scenes. I mean, you kind of see like, oh, the, when all of a sudden the Fed is just going to say, oh, and now we've got FedCoin um, and we're digitalizing currency. And so there's all kinds of clips uh, that have come out of the World Economic Forum where they actually are admitting that um, CBDCs are about control. It gives them robust control. And they, you know, they use scary examples like, you know, criminals and money launderers. And, you know, this is to prevent crime. And then they also simultaneously say that CBDCs, digital, digital currency, is about convenience. This will make it a lot easier for migrants to send uh, money back home in the form of remittances. Um, and then finally, um, I, you know, I said just a moment ago that their stated theme at Davos this year was uh, rebuilding trust. That wasn't the real theme. The real theme this year is artificial intelligence. And you, you see it everywhere. You're going to see even more of it. I mean, all the commercials on TV are going to be talking about how AI is going to do this and that. You know, the new Samsung phone has AI built in and, uh, you know, Salesforce commercials with Matthew McConaughey walking through, uh, you know, a trippy landscape and talking about AI. It's everywhere. Uh, and, and the thing to know about AI is, yes, it has great potential, potential to make everyone's lives better in a lot of ways, but it also has terrible potential, potential to put a lot of people out of work. And so one of the, the keynote speakers at Davos this year, her name is Kristalina Georgieva. She's the managing director of the International Monetary Fund. One of these people, you don't really know who they are. One of these unelected bureaucrats who are, you know, authoring the policies of our future she says that the IMF has just put out a report stating that artificial intelligence will upend uh, the job market. 60% of jobs are going to be affected by this artificial intelligence and automation revolution. And so, um, you know, in, in the United States, 60% uh, of jobs is easily, uh, you know, uh, 70 million people. And, the, and she says half of those are going to be negatively impacted, either fully re removing some of those jobs from the economy, or you just won't, you know, you'll have to go down to part time. And, and I can give you some examples of the jobs that are already being effective, affected. But uh, the, the key, like why artificial intelligence is a Davos agenda item and the unofficial theme this year is because artificial intelligence accomplishes so many goals that they are trying to achieve. Number one, digital ID. In order, well, first, before digital ID is the job losses will lead to growing calls for a universal basic income. Europe, I mean, a lot of countries in Europe already have a form of UBI, which is basically welfare checks for all. Um, and, and, and a lot of people, you can see the appeal. It's like, who doesn't want free money, right? Um, and so when people, you know, theoretically are losing their jobs by the millions, there will be louder and louder calls for UBI. Well, UBI, uh, they are saying this. People like uh, companies like BlackRock and, and Sam Altman, who is the head of OpenAI, the maker of ChatGPT, they are doing studies on UBI. And it's no coincidence um, that you know, the AI companies are doing studies on universal basic income. And Sam Altman says, in order to get your universal basic income after the robots take your jobs, is you're going to need a digital ID. He also says that the way to get faster UBI checks is through digital currencies, CBDC. And so you can see uh, how this AI is actually really going to accomplish, could, or it looks like it will, accomplish a lot of the goals that they've been working on for years now, and what is the end game in all of this? It's a social credit score system. Uh, Klaus Schwab and, the, and Davos, they had, you know, they give, they roll out the red carpet to China. They actually love the Chinese system. They won't say it like that. They'll compliment the efficiency of China, or they'll say they are really good at mobilizing resources or kind of use these euphemisms. But really what they love about China is the authoritarian social credit score type system, the, the type of system that is powerful enough to cut off dissidents from the rest of the system. And so, 
you know, we can we could talk uh, all day about that, but that is the end goal of this artificial intelligence and the digitalization of everything is a central is a is a social credit score where if you are against the system, a threat to the system, then you can be quickly identified, you know, facial recognition technology on every street corner um, and cut out from the system, much like people who were unvaccinated were during the pandemic. If you didn't have the proper paperwork, you couldn't go to restaurants in New York City or sporting events. And so, you, you know, we, we see the writing on the wall. They're not slowing down these plans. If anything, they're accelerating them. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. That, the, that, that kind of stuff is, is scary. You know, like on the one hand you think, okay, you, you have maybe paranoid Christians who have, you know, revelation saying uh, in the future, there will be a system, this beast that will control you. You won't be able to do anything, buy anything, go anywhere without showing this marking. And then you have these like anti-religious, um, anti-human uh, elitists who are saying, what if we create a system whereby we can control everything people do? They can't go anywhere. They can't buy anything. They can't talk bad about their government. They can't go to church. They, they can't miss their mask over their face. They can't go to school. Like they can control everything. They do this in China now where if you don't do a certain thing, your phone literally turns off. You can't go to the subway. You can't buy groceries. You can't get back to your house. I mean, it, it like this level of uh, we have power, therefore we control you is just so amplified in these people's minds. And then you have uh, what, what's the name of the the big um, World Economic Forum guy, Yo Johan Har Yuval Noah Harari. Yes, this guy, right? So he writes this this uh, book uh, about you know, humans coming from cavemen 400,000 years ago and the progression of man up through the 21st century. And then on the other hand, he, he's trying to wipe out humanity. He literally wants less humans on the planet. He's a eugenics uh, that, that would love to see the human population cut in half, whether that's by a virus or war or AI technology or uh, just demonizing motherhood, parenthood, things like that. Um, so who who are the who are the big players that we should be watching out for other than just Klaus Schwab? Yeah, you all know Harari is a, a very scary dude. Uh, he's you know a, a thought leader. He's quoted extensively by Klaus Schwab in Schwab's books. Um, he's this guy who's written a book, Sapiens. Uh, his other books, uh, Homo Deus, God Man, uh, it, you know, have sold 30 million copies worldwide. He's someone that Barack Obama celebrates and praises. He's he's one of the great uh, technocratic transhumanist thinkers of our time. Mark Zuckerberg loves him. Bill Gates loves Yuval Noah Harari. They've all, uh, you know, signaled their support for his ideas. Um, if anything that you hear on on this show sounds crazy, or if you think that people are overhyping the threat that the World Economic poses to, form poses to the rest of us, you need to go watch his interviews. Go watch the Anderson Cooper interview on 60 Minutes with uh, Yuval Noah Harari, where Harari talks about uh, useless people, how this artificial intelligence and automation revolution is going to create a whole new caste system, a new class of people that he call he calls useless people. And he says, what do we do about all these useless people without jobs? Sam Altman at uh, OpenAI says, well, we just give them UBI checks. Um, and uh, Yuval Noah Harari says, well, we, we can placate them with a, with a cocktail of drugs and video games. And we'll just, and, and that should really scare a lot of people when they're talking about, you know, full speed ahead on the automation. We're not totally sure how many jobs it will displace. Maybe none, you know, I'm not a Luddite. And a lot of people said computers would put a lot of you know secretaries and whatnot out of work and there's more jobs than ever with computers. But the thing about the automation and the AI revolution is it's happening so fast. I mean, the advent of computers to today was a 50 year process or so, you know, so from the seventies on um, the, and it, it was kind of like a slow thing and spreadsheets, you know, Excel only came around in the nineties and stuff. The thing about AI is it's happening every day is another breakthrough. And so you're not going to be able to train people fast enough. I mean, Microsoft just the other day put out a story about how radiologists 
are, are obsolete. And so you've got people in school right now studying to become a radiologist. Well, it turns out that, you know, the uh, GPTs and the AI engines from Microsoft can spot uh, fractures or whatever you might be looking for on an X-ray or an MRI much faster than a human can. And so much like at the checkouts where, you know, uh, 30 cashiers have been replaced by one manager overseeing 30 machines, um, that's how a lot of fields will go. So radiologists are gone, according to Microsoft. And so what H Harari says is this is going to create a new class of useless people. And the fact that he thinks that placating people with drugs and video games uh, is going to be like, a, you know, sat, I, it, they're not going to pay you. This is what a lot of people have misconceptions about UBI, UBI is like, well, you know, I'll, if, I, if I can just, you know, get a UBI check, that'll free up my time and I can go take cooking classes and, and learn how to play the guitar and this will be great. No, these, these guys at the World Economic Forum don't want to pay you so you can just take cooking classes. And so what they're going to do with all of these uh, useless people. It's kind of unclear, but you know, I can't imagine that they're just going to peel money off from their own pockets to take care of everyone else. In oh, fact, yeah. Sam, yeah, Sam Altman did a study. You know, his UBI study. He says that every uh, every working adult in America would would be able to get somewhere around thirteen thousand five hundred dollars as a form of UBI check. And so, you know, you may think like that's not that's not terrible thirteen five thirteen thousand five hundred a month. No, he said that's per year. Um, and so nobody can live on these kind of uh, wages. I mean, it's going to create a whole new poverty class is what it's going to create. And you're not going to, you know, you're going to be struggling to get by. And so, you know, it's not not to fear monger here, but you should be aware if you're, you know, studying and looking into a field, look at how AI is going to disrupt that field because it's going to disrupt every field. And so, you know, maybe you should be learning to code. Yeah, well, that's what Biden's telling uh, people in the energy uh, sector right now. Um, I've decided I don't want the I don't want the UBI check. I want the illegal immigrant UBI check because they seem to get more way more benefits than American citizens that have worked their whole life and and uh, are now receiving Social Security. Um, I know we're coming up on time here. I wanted to get your thoughts on something. So George Soros, who has been basically funding wars, political campaigns, district attorneys, attorney generals, governors, presidential campaigns, causing chaos around the world. He's now in his 90s. He's decided, I got to pass this off to one of my children. Gives his son, Alex Soros, $25 billion. This guy immediately lays off like 40% of the company. Uh, he just, he's greedy. He wants all of that money. He just put out a very cryptic tweet over on Twitter X uh, where he says, that uh, crime and inflation have basically evaporated and so have the theories around what really caused them. Then there's a photo of a piece of glass shattered from a bullet hole and somebody holding $47 in American money. And many are taking this as him putting out a cryptic message to the elites. We need to take Donald Trump out. He cannot become the 47th president. Did you see any of this? What What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I did. I did. I saw the piece before Alex Soros posted it. And you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, Alex Soros has taken the reins of the dark money empire of the Soros uh, Open Society Network, $25 billion. And it always hovers around $25 billion. So um, it's not like as he pours millions and hundreds of millions and billions into various philanthropic causes, it ever depletes. He's got the the for-profit side of the Soros network, Soros Fund Management, which is like a money printer. And so it always just stays right around $25 billion. He never runs out of money. Um, he, In fact, I just saw a headline today, so, uh, Alex Soros is pouring th uh, poured over $3 million into uh, the NGOs that are facilitating the migrant invasion at the southern border. But anyway, to the Atlantic piece, that piece was put out by The Atlantic. And so many people may have heard of The Atlantic, but don't know much about it. The Atlantic on the totem pole of uh, disinformation mainstream media uh, uh, outlets, this is like at the top. This is above The New York Times. This is the outlet that disseminates the talking points that The New York Times and people like Alex Soros, I mean, he's involved in the crafting process, but it's actually owned by a woman billionaire woman named Laureen Powell Jobs. And she is thick, you know, she and the Soros family are thick as thieves. I actually, in Control of Garks in the uh, mainstream mind control chapter, calculated exactly how much Laureen Powell Jobs 
Uh, this is Steve Jobs' widow, by the way. She's taken the Apple fortune from Steve Jobs, uh, inherited it, and is now pouring it into various left-wing and globalist causes. Uh, I, I calculated that the Soros uh, Network and Laureen Powell Jobs have spent $1.71 billion on their various uh, mainstream mind control efforts. That would be things like she spent $100 million to buy the Atlantic. That's this article uh, with the with the bullet hole in the 47, which a lot of people are commenting. I mean, Mike Flynn, General Mike Flynn uh, commented on it, saying that this looks like a, putting out basically a hit uh, on Donald Trump. And so, you know, we don't know uh, if that's what it was, but it doesn't look good. And so then it kind of goes like this. This is kind of the anatomy of how misinformation from the mainstream media comes down. The Atlantic writes a piece. It's total gaslighting. It's saying that crime in the cities is down. Well, enforcement is down. That's what's happening. I mean, there are basically no-go zones in a lot of our cities across America where the cops just don't want to go in there anymore because they're going to get called racist or whatever for, for prosecuting crime. And so crime is down because the prosecutors are all Soros-funded prosecutors who are deciding that crime is isn't illegal anymore. I mean, in Cal, I know, I think you're in California. It's terrible what the prosecutors have done to California. And, and now, you you know, stores are leaving, you know, shut, shutting down, uh, no Walgreens and CVS want to be in business there anymore. I know a lot of other big stores are closing. So crime isn't down, but here's the Atlantic putting out a piece proving with apparently with data that uh, crime is down. Well, then Alex Soros retweets that piece and so do the mainstream media outlets. They all do their own pieces like, aha, see, The Atlantic has done a study saying crime is down. So all of these people worried about crime, shut up, uh, don't, don't ask questions, nothing to see here. And so there's a couple of issues there. I mean, yes, the threat that that looked like uh, to Donald Trump is, you know, that, that's alarming and needs to be investigated. But also just how like these, these control oligarchs, these billionaires, distribute talking points to each other and then they blast it out far and wide and the next thing you know half the country believes that crime is down not the people in the cities of course but yeah. all of the voters everywhere else interesting so it's almost like they they plant the seed knowing that a thousand hungry news outlets will pick it up and write derivative articles and then they can go look 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 how many people are writing about how crime is down it must be true and so they yeah. they Perception is reality and they create the perception and then you create the reality in your mind. But we all know that crime isn't down. I mean, you you can just turn on the TV. You can go to Twitter. And I, I mean, it's just it's insane how much crime is going on. OK, so uh, to, to wrap up here. Well, and, and, and just the okay. final step in that in that uh, in that process, there is all of these pieces are out out there saying that crime is down. And then you go to have a conversation with your, you know, your sister, your brother, your parents, your cousin, you know, family or friends, your neighbors. And you'll hear them saying, oh, well, crime. Everybody knows crime is down. It's like, are you crazy? You know, this is why it is so frustrating to try to uh, tell the truth to people is because they have been. I mean, I'll call what it is brainwashed into believing the Atlantic Council or the Soros talking points. And, uh, it, you know, we can't, you know, the country's so divided. Mainly, I mean, I would say that one of the biggest issues in this country is the media control and the stranglehold. And that's why shows like yours are so important, Stephen, is because getting the truth out there, we need to break out of this sort of uh, legacy media situation we have. Um, and so, yeah, I applaud you for what you're doing and your part in getting the truth out to people. Well, I appreciate that. I, our, you know, I, I messaged you guys on our last video. It got suppressed. Uh, of course, YouTube denies it. Um, but, you know, we, we know that uh, these people are in bed with each other. They're all scratching each other's back so that Microsoft can become a, a $3 trillion company. And then all that money feeds back to Gates and all the others so that they can continue to control us and control their perception, uh, uh, people's perception of them. Um, in, in your book, Control Agart, um, what are some of the other topics that you go deep on? And then I'll make sure to leave a link to that down below for people. Sure. Well, I, I basically, the chapters are broken down by the areas of control that they want to exert. So there's a chapter on energy control and all about how uh, the green energy agenda is not about saving the planet, obviously. Uh, all of their solutions are actually worse for the planet um, in, in many ways, whether it's the war on farmers. I mean, you see uh, you know, the farmers all around the world are rising up against 
these climate change regulations because nobody knows sustainability better than a farmer. A farmer will go out of business if they overwork their, their land and they pollute their land. Nobody wants polluted uh, fruits and veggies or livestock. And so the farmers are the best ecologists we have. And there's a all out war on the farmers waged by people like Bill Gates, who's buying up all the farmland in our country. Uh, and also like organizations like the World Economic Forum, which are really the big agrochemical companies like Monsanto and, and uh, you know, the others like those. Um, so the war on farmers and the war on energy are the, the kind of two uh, sides of the same coin. It's all about control, not saving the planet. Um, you know, chapter six is uh, all about the Soros uh, network and how even when George Soros dies, his son is going to carry on his legacy of interfering in elections and funding uh, all kinds of causes that are, um, you know, things that are important. I mean, they're either they've already got the prosecutors. Next, they're going after the sheriffs. And when they buy off sheriff's races, which that's the thing that's uh, so insidious about this, it's, it's not expensive. These are not expensive races, prosecutor, DA races or uh, sheriff's races. So a million dollars in a sheriff's race will totally buy the candidate. And once we have Soros backed sheriffs, then we're in real trouble because those are the people who, those are the only people who can really protect us um, from this onslaught that we're facing from all sides. You need the sheriffs on your side. So pay attention to your local sheriff's races. If you get even a whiff that uh, Soros is backing a uh, candidate, you need to spread the word on that. Um, chapter seven, that's uh, follow the money. That's all about the digitalization of currency and IDs and how that's going to work together towards a social credit score, not just in America, but all around the world. Um, aid is mainstream mind control. That's the th people like Soros and Laureen Powell Jobs and all of the legacy media outlets and the basically six corporations that own 90% of the news. Uh, nine is the dystopian present. That's all the transhumanism and, and things like metaverse and these new headsets, Apple Vision Pro. Uh, Microsoft's got its HoloLens. The Oculus is kind of flopping because nobody wants their vision obstructed, but they'll figure out a way to get something, some wearable tech that you know, you'll never be able to escape from uh, the metaverse type realities, virtual or whatever realities. Um, and then finally, 10 is the, uh, the end game. And that is all about how uh, the control oligarchs are in bed with China. They don't view China as a competitor or an adversary or anything like that. They view China as a friend and a partner. And so what, what they, they, they are envious. People like Bill Gates and Klaus Schwab, they are envious of the total control that the Chinese Communist Party has over its populace. I mean, the CCP membership is a tiny fraction of the overall membership of China, and yet they rule with an iron fist. And that is because of things like a massive surveillance state, um, biometric you know, and facial recognition everywhere, and the social credit score. And so that really shows you the final chapter, spoiler alert, shows you where all this is headed, shows you how far along they are. And I would say, you know, 2030 is the year that they say, agenda 2030, we're gonna have uh, full control over every aspect, agriculture, food, and all, and energy, and money, and everything. Um, I would say to be safe, it's uh, just a couple of years away. I say, uh, you know, think about 2025, next year is when a lot of these systems will be put into place um, and there may be no going back. Oh gosh, okay. Uh, check out Control Agarch. It's it's really detailed, super good information. Seamus, thank you so much for coming on, all the research, your courage in exposing these people, even though they spend hundreds of millions or billions to protect their names, keep the lies and, and all the damaging things they do out of the media. But people like you and me, we're exposing them. So thank you so much. I'll put that down below and hope you have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thanks so much, Stephen. The last thing I'll say is you got to have hope. I do believe we can win this thing. I mean, we outnumber them a thousand to one. And so the, the key here is spread the word, wake as many people up as you can, because, you know, they, they are they are nervous. I mean, I, I, they're panicking in a lot of ways about Donald Trump. And, and that's why they have to make the theme of their their Davos event this year, uh, rebuilding trust. They don't you know, they want us to stay asleep and trusting them. Uh, but as, the more people you can wake up, the better. And I do I do have hope there's recommendations in the in the end uh, of the book. So, uh, you know, it's heavy material, but but we got this. So uh, stand strong.